You're listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense with your host, Doug Thorpe. Here's Doug. Well, hello again, everyone. You're listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense. I am your host, Doug Thorpe, and today we're going to interview a uh, guy that's a serial entrepreneur. He's got some interesting things going on right now, but he also has a very interesting uh, journey to tell us about. I uh, want to give a welcome to Paul Barron. Paul, how are you, sir? Good, Doug. Thank you very much. Nice to see you and nice to uh, be introduced to your audience as well. Yeah, you bet. So let's let's talk about uh, the journey first, and we'll kind of save the current situation. Tell everybody a little bit about your story. Like I said, you're, uh, as I recall, a serial entrepreneur. You've gone through several chapters in life. Uh, so give us the over, over, overview of everything. Well, I'll, I'll try not to far too far afield and and dissuade your audience from paying attention to anything that might be interesting or relevant, but I am 70 years old, so uh, I don't have to start with Paul was born at a very young age and go back that far. Um, But suffice to say that uh, my journey really began uh, in college. Um, Tennis is uh, my passion and swimming uh, for two athletic pursuits that I still do competitively today. Um, And despite the extra 50 pounds that I've got on since my college days. I, I still am pretty good out there in, in both venues. But nice. uh, that aside, I started stringing tennis rackets for my college. Um, I was a captain of the tennis team back then, and uh, I made money, uh, my spending money at college, supplemented by the good, good graces of my parents. Um, but my spending money was found through stringing tennis rackets for the university. And I developed a, quite a following after a couple of years doing that. And on graduation, um, even though my avocation was education and mathematics, and I did get a job right out of college as a high school mathematics teacher, I also opened up a tennis retail shop in the town where I went to college. And, uh, and that grew to three, three, call, three shops um, in the Hudson Valley, New York area. Um, and... Uh, was a a fairly success, fairly good success as a small business. Uh, I had a partner. We grew, as I said, from one to two to three shops and uh, serviced the area. And I learned an awful lot. Uh, The most important thing were the hats I liked to wear and the hats I didn't like to wear in the world of business. And that early experience in my early 20s carried over really through today. Um, I like to tell people who ask me, well, what do I do? And I say, well, I'm really not sure what I'm going to do when I grow up. Um, but I, uh, I've worn all the hats that are necessary for either working for somebody or uh, for owning your own business. And what I mean by that is, you know, as an example, when I was in the restaurant business, I owned a restaurant for 12 years. And, uh, and even though I went into it for the real estate and my partner was the food guy, and I went into it because I was going to manage the numbers and the books and the ordering processes, but still... I learned how to wash dishes. I learned how to cook. I learned how to tend bar. Um, I learned all aspects of the business. And I always found that the customer interactions, the relationships is really what excited me about that business and kept me in it for 12 years. And that was one of my success stories. And that restaurant today, which was founded in 1979, is still open today, um, 43 years later. So I'm pretty proud of that. Um, not, not the same owner, of course, I sold it and it's been sold a couple of times, but it still has the same name and the same menu. So that makes me feel really good. And I still go back to it every time I go back upstate New York. If I may interject, that's very rare in the food business. Uh, I mean, occasionally a marquee brand will, you know, get sold once or twice, but eventually some future owner tinkers with it and it loses its appeal and, uh, you know, doesn't survive the long-term transition. So that is quite a, quite a feat. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. Yeah. That, that's, uh, yeah, we founded it. We created it. Uh, we built a nice, uh, a nice foundation in a historic building that we renovated. And, and because of that, um, that package, um, it, it retained its flavor and its culture over the years. And even though it was sold twice since, um, since we first sold it in 19, early 1990s, um, 
it, it did retain its menu and its and its uh, environment and its look and feel. Do, so do you ever go back there on your own? To, yeah, yeah. Uh, I actually, I, I do go back. I live in Wilmington, North Carolina now. Uh, uh, this is about 75 miles north of New York City in Mon a little town called Montgomery, New York, off the New York Thruway. Um, but we go back almost every summer um, to visit with family and friends in New York. And we always make a stop there for lunch or dinner. Nice. And, yeah, uh, that's fun. Yeah, the menu is still good and the place... We, you know, memories and history are good, especially when it's a positive experience, as this was. Um, but, but with that said, getting back on, on to your, your question about my journey, um, I like to tell people who ask, what is Paul going to do? Well, what are you doing? Is I'm fairly industry and product agnostic. And what I mean by that is what excited me about various different businesses. And I've I've done everything from working for large corporations to realizing that I did not like that environment so much. And I really liked the control that I had in my own businesses. Um, but I, I've had a software development company. I've had, um, that was one of my success stories. Um, I have had uh, another restaurant, which was a lesser success than the New York one. Um, that was, I call, I call those learning experiences, not failures. Um, but um, and with that, again, with that said, I, I found that I, I really liked the relationship part of things. It was always my job, even at my restaurant, which was an early uh, entrepreneurial venture. Um, my job at the restaurant was really to kind of greet the people and keep them in the place. It was a very popular restaurant. It became very popular. And, and I was the guy who made sure that people got to their seats. Um, sometimes it was much later um, than when their reservation was, and they would get very angry and whatever, but I was able to kind of schmooze them, if your audience is familiar with the term, um, to keep them happy and placated, and we, um, so that, uh, because I knew that when my partner, who was the food guy, got them back into the restaurant, that their experience would be wonderful, and they'd forget about that horrible Paul Barron up front, who made them wait an extra hour for their seat. Um, so yeah. it was the relationship building that, <clears throat> I, that I really enjoyed. And then that carried over when I went on to my software development company, um, which was, uh, again, uh, developing relationships with, um, with businesses in the, in the marketing arena. Um, and that got me involved more in the sales and marketing end, learning about my customers, listening to them, what their problems were that I could solve. Uh, the most important thing for any entrepreneur who has great ideas, make sure that you are solving somebody's problem with your idea, uh, that you're not just coming up with what you think is a better mousetrap for no reason other than it seems cool. Um, you know, it has to solve a very real problem. And so, uh, so I, I listen to people and I listen to their, um, their issues and their concerns and then try to find a solution. Sometimes it was with a company that I had or product or service that I offered. Sometimes it was just being a trusted resource. Becoming, a, becoming that person that they could rely on to help them find the solution if I could not provide it myself. And that too, I found very satisfying. And so okay. I went on to, to um, finding other products, primarily from companies outside of the United States um, that were trying to identify their high value customers, markets here in the US to either grow their business or to uh, engage strategic partners or vendors um, whatever would help them establish presence and growth. And so I did this with a, an Australian self-service dog wash system that I imported. Um, I did it for a Austrian baby bottle manufacturer, a Chinese headband headphone, an Israeli media company. Um, and I, I reached levels of success in all of these ventures, but as a hired gun. And I made enough, financially, I did well enough that I could retire, which I did to go and play tennis and swim some more a couple of times during my career. And, uh, but I was always restless and always looking for things. And so one time about three or four years ago, I was searching as I always do. And I got approached by a, a company who is now a competitor of mine, a company out of Germany who had a vertical printing machine. I had never seen anything like that. And Doug, I kind of fancy myself as a fairly normal um, American capitalist. Um, if I see something and I, um, and I like it, uh, you know, and I can afford it, I, I, and it could, it could solve a problem or, or, or a passion of my own, I may, may very well try to purchase it. But this was something I had never seen or heard about before, which I found very unusual. And so I did my homework. First of all, I could not make the deal with this German manufacturer because they wanted me, like all the other companies, to be a hired gun. And at that point in my life, in my late 60s, I decided that if I was ever going to do something anymore, um, I was going to own it and I was going to uh, be total control of the product or the service. 
And so, uh, but I love this product. I found it very fascinating. So I did my homework, did my research. I found out who else is doing it. Found out there was only a handful, literally five manufacturers worldwide who had these vertical printing machines who would take digital art and put it on wall surfaces, indoors or outdoors. And I found out that the German was really just a copycat of the technology from the originator, which was a Chinese manufacturer that dates back about 10 years. Um, but all of these companies were confined to Europe and Asia and the Middle East. None of them came across the pond, so to speak, to North and South America. Well, I was fascinated enough. I was able to create the deal I wanted it I wanted to um, with the original manufacturer of this technology. Um, I'm actually today a co-owner of three patents that I helped uh, refine um, here for the products. And so we have, um, I own the North and South American markets, basically all of the Western hemisphere. Um, and, and we are growing uh, by introducing the wall printing and floor printing machines um, to audiences in the United States that are either individuals or businesses, entrepreneurs, uh, people who want to establish themselves and be the wall printer in their own communities or territories. We're not a franchise. Um, we, uh, I don't, I have 15 years of franchising experience as a phase in my background. Um, it's not like I went out and bought myself a Dunkin' Donuts or a McDonald's or something, uh, but I did provide technology to franchise systems. So I learned early on that was not a model I wanted to do. I didn't want to reach into people's pockets for royalties and, and tell them they had to be called the wall printer. This is designed to be for businesses who want to really create their own identity, but own their market. And so we support them and we support their growth. And I'm very proud and pleased that I've grown a team in these COVID lace times um, over the past two years. We have over 75 new businesses we've created. Um, they're at, at very various degrees of success and um, operation because a lot of people have invested the cost of these machines and in their business um, as an afterthought or a side hustle, so to speak, but some have gone in full, full blown, full yeah. time. And so anyway, that's where we are today. And that's, that's the journey. So I want to be clear so that everybody understands this thing called the wall printer. It's a vertical printer, but think of it this way. I was in a diner the other day and visiting with a friend. We were having a breakfast <clears> meeting and I looked up and lo and behold, here's this huge mural. It's probably a 15 wide by, I don't know, eight feet tall mural painted on the wall. And I said to my friend, hey, I know the guy that has a machine that can do that. You don't need to hire an artist to come in and freehand the drawing on the wall. You could uh, create the graphic via, you know, some computer program and just send it to the printer, basically, and put it on the wall. It, that's what I understand your machine can do. Is that right? You are correct, Doug. It, it is a, um, we take any digital image, whether it's something you take from your, on your phone. Um, now, of course, it, depending on the quality, a digitally created image or what is known in the printing business or, um, as a vector format, uh, a digitally created image will enlarge and look beautiful at any size at all. So that eight foot by 15 foot mural that you saw, if you took that with your camera, it may look great on your computer or your phone, and it may enlarge to a couple of feet by a couple of feet, but it may not enlarge to eight feet by 15 feet and still look crisp and clear uh, if it was not digitally created in programs like uh, the tools of the trade of a graphics artist and designer and most, most painters these days that start graphically on their computers um, to create their image before taking pen to paint to the wall um, or brush to paint to the wall. Um, most people do create things digitally first and, and, and uh, incubate their ideas that way because that's just the nature of the fact we have that technology available to us. Um, but, but you're right that we can take any digital image and put it on any surface. If your audience is having video as well as audio, you can see behind me, this is a five foot by eight foot mural. My office staff wasn't nice enough to give me a window in my office like I gave to all of them. So I had to wall paint one on my concrete wall. But that is, that is created with a wall printer on cinder block. The wall printer will go on any surface at all. It could be your regular standard um, home and, and uh, commercial sheetrock wall board as we call it. Um, but it could be on cement, wood, glass, tile, uh, makes no difference, uh, whatever the surface is. And the surface doesn't have to be smooth. So again, if your audience can see this, you can see the grout and the crevices in the, and the uh, imperf imperfections in the cement. 
Uh, the same thing goes for something like a, a door that might have a recess. It's like panels or something. Our printer will move horizontally in and out from the wall on what we call the z-axis for uh, those in the audience that remember their algebra days from X and Y, um, we, we integrate a Z axis, which goes <clears throat> horizontally in and out, and it will spray ink in all those crevices and, and do that automatically. So it's a pretty cool Fascinating. machine. Well, in, in, in the world of high-end graphics and logo branding and all of those things that uh, companies and businesses and restaurants and auto body shops and all those that are doing now it's a it's a fascinating tool and when i was um browsing this library that kind of hooked us up paul i, I that caught my eye and i was just fascinated i'm a little bit of a techno geek I've, I've always been an early adopter of new emerging technologies and um i i saw your device and just was fascinated by it so talk again about the business model. You said you're, you're not franchising uh, with these guys that are expanding the business, but how do they come to you and what is it you're setting them up to do? Sure. So happy to answer that, Doug. And, and let, me, let me start by kind of um, rephrasing or, or picking up on what you just said about um, about you know, the uh, new technology and something being innovative. What I always tell people when they're exploring this as a business opportunity, and I'll get to answer your question directly, but what I always tell people is, look, if you want to think you really like this technology from what you've seen, like a video of it working, it looks really cool, and you think that this is something you want to learn more about and you want to actually um, take on as a business, it's a good news and bad news story. The good news is you'll be the first one in your community to be doing this because it just doesn't exist. The bad news is you're going to be the first one in your community doing this because it's going to be up to you to market it, to introduce it to people. And so therein lies that business model you just asked about. Um, I believe that our community, now we'll support you. We have literally hundreds, if not thousands of examples that we've done and that our growing community has produced in terms of um, wall prints and now floor prints too. We have a floor printer as well that does the same thing on any kind of a floor surface where you can put a logo or something um, onto a floor and uh, personalized life park, personalized parking spaces in garages on concrete. It could do anything, but uh, but the the wall print which can go in residences or commercial um, businesses or schools or hospitals, indoors or outdoors, um, is designed. Um, you know, to be taken on by somebody who wants to grow it as a business. Um, rarely is somebody buying this as a home hobby solution. It costs twenty five to twenty nine, thirty thousand dollars for the machine. So it's not what you're buying. Just it's not your desktop printer. Let's put it simply like that. It's a it's a commercial quality machine designed to be used day in and day out. Requires maintenance, um, but it, it's it's an extremely high margin um, and return on investment. So the business model really wants people to take who take this on to grow their markets without interference. Because once people see this, well, I guess the best analogy is, you know, you got Burger King and McDonald's and Wendy's and Hardee's. You got lots of hamburger places. You got lots of pizza places. You got lots of plumbers and pest control companies, you know, whether they're franchises or not. Um, there's when people see something and they see somebody making money at it and it looks interesting and they think they can do it. Well, they may very well jump into that market. So I believe when you've got something as innovative as this is, and somebody is going to take upon themselves to introduce it to market, they should be rewarded by being able to do that exclusively and not have me sell a machine to just anybody who wants one at that point. So we reward, I don't know if the right word is reward or award, but the person who raises their hand and says, I want Detroit or I want Atlanta or I want some little town in Texas or someplace um, and I want to become the wall printer in this area. Well, they, they purchase a machine, they pay a fee for the territory based on the population of that. We have a formula and it's based on the population. And then they do have an obligation because at that point, we agree not to sell to anybody else, but just to support them. And so they create their own business. Again, not a franchise. They call themselves whatever they want to call themselves, Detroit wall printers, or maybe they have an existing business that's a, um, a painter or a general contractor or uh, a photographer or whoever they might be and that wants to take this on and they can just make this a part of their business. 
and another service they provide. And, and then we sell printers only to them. Um, but at that point, since we're putting ourselves out of business for that area, that territory, whatever geographic you want to call it, um, we then obligate them to grow the market and purchase more wall printers over time. Because we do have the experience, This, while it's new here in the United States and Canada and South America, because of my introducing it, it is not new technology. We have the benefit of having explored when I did my homework on this to find out the answer to the number one question, can somebody make money doing this? I found out that people were doing this for five, seven, 10 years, and they were growing to buy one wall printer, then another one, then another one to be able to service that market and hiring people to use the machine and having them work for them. And so that's our business model. Uh, now, if somebody does want to buy just a printer, yes, they can. Uh, I will sell them just, just a printer. But then if somebody else comes in after them and buys a territory and pays that fee and takes on that obligation, at that point, if the first buyer wants to buy another printer, they can't buy it from us. They have to go through that local exclusive wall printer or distributor. Um, yeah. And they also get a discount. When you mm -hmm. buy a printer from us and a territory, one of the benefits is we actually reduce the price of the printer because you're obligating yourself. So once again, using that franchise analogy, Doug, you know, if you want to buy a McDonald's franchise, you're going to pay a million dollars just for that name, you know, and other franchises are going to cost you for the goodwill of the name that those companies have established. And to use that name, you're going to pay a fee for that. Our fee is, is actually reimbursed to you in discounts over time. As you buy more printers, you're going to then recover those territory fees. That's how I structure this business. Nice. That's, that's great. Good to know. Well, Paul, we're already uh, up to a break time here. We're going to take a short pause. And when we come right back, we're going to learn more about Paul's experience as a serial entrepreneur and this uh, fascinating device called the wall printer. We'll be right back. Business is all about solving complex problems as fast as you can create them. Become the best problem solver by leading others to greatness too. And the first step is going to DougThorpe.com. Doug Thorpe is known globally for coaching entrepreneurs and business leaders, improving their performance and the work output of everyone surrounding them. You can find health, wealth, and happiness by learning to lead others to health, wealth, and happiness. Go to DougThorpe.com now and order Doug's books or hire him to coach your managers. That's Doug, T-H-O-R-P-E.com. Well, hello again, everyone. We're back. You're listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense. I'm your host, Doug Thorpe, and today I've got Paul Barron with me. Paul is a serial entrepreneur. We've been talking about his current venture, which involves a fascinating uh, piece of technology called the wall printer. As the uh, image may suggest, it's, it is a large-scale printer that allows digital rendering on large surfaces like office buildings or exterior walls and fences and barricades and things like that. So um, that's a fascinating story. And there's more of that on the first half of the show if you didn't hear it. But there's something we were talking about in the early going, Paul, that I want to get back to. And that is this idea of customer service. You shared in your story that as you went through your several different kinds of business, you realize that you enjoyed the customer relationship part of it, the interaction uh, and, and the work with the customer. So I'd, I'd like you to talk a little bit more about that. And what I'm thinking specifically, I hear a lot today of working with business owners that are, uh, they haven't quite figured that out yet. They, they love their idea, the thing they've created a company to do, but now that they've actually begun selling to the market, they realize that customer relationship thing is not necessarily their strength. It's not something they particularly enjoy doing. So uh, let, let's talk about that a little bit. Sure, Doug. And, and they're, they're very, they should be top of mind subjects. If they're not for anybody looking to, whether you're looking to work for somebody or work for a business or an idea and, and bring it to fruition, or you want to go out on your own and create something um, or sell something uh, or build a business around something. Um, I, I was told a long time ago when I was trying to explore the characteristics of a, of a great CEO, what makes a, a great leader or a CEO. And what I was told, um, which I firmly believe to this day, um, is that the, great, the greatest leaders are those 
that are smart enough to hire the best people for the jobs that are needed and then wise enough to just back off and let them do it. Um, because you're going to find during your career, whatever it is, uh, whether you're on your own or you're working for a business or, or an individual, there are going to be hats you like to wear and hats you don't like to wear. Um, I was always very confident in my ability um, to sell something, which gave me a lot of independence um, as opposed to maybe some other air avenues that I could have taken um, in my career path. Uh, because when you can sell something and you can generate revenue for a business, um, you get a lot more freedom um, to kind of do that and to succeed um, and learn. And so it's really important, uh, I think, along the way to, to listen and to learn, uh, you know, what your customers want. And that customer service aspect of things um, can influence either what you're selling and providing today or what you should be selling or providing to the customers who rely on you and rely on your products, which may very well fit the bill today, but as they grow, it may require some flexibility on your part um, to be able to respond to that need or that growth that your customers are having. You know, so, so every business is going to require the same types of financial, legal, um, customer service, sales, marketing, you know, all these basic elements of a business are going to be there. Now, which hats you should wear and which ones to best serve your business, um, you know, you, because you do have to serve both the business and yourself. You know, what is going to make you feel good at the end of the day? What's going to let you sleep well at night and feel accomplished? And then what's going to help the business? You know, those are all important things. And you don't want to really shortchange yourself or your family um, or your employees or your stakeholders, um, your investors. Um, at any stage of this. And if it means you should be doing it, do it. If it means that you should back off and let somebody else do it, well then find that person, an individual and, and create that role or allow them to, uh, to succeed in that role. Um, you know, that's, that's, I guess my best way of answering that. Um, I yeah. tried my best, I, you know, to do that. Part, part of, uh, as, as I think I alluded to, one of the dynamics when I talk to small business owners is is the idea mo most often the motivation for starting the business is around some idea or some vision. You either uh, have a thing that you want to get manufactured and distributed or you've got a service you want to put out there. Um, and um, I, I'm thinking, for instance, you you mentioned at one stage in your career owning a software development company. That's a great example of um, a model where the individuals who might have the wherewithal to start a company like that and actually deliver a good service are probably, and I'm, I'm broadly stereotyping here, but are probably a little more introverted personalities. So the, the idea of schmoozing, to use your word, with a, with a prospect or a current client is just not on high on their list of what they would like to do. So uh, the challenge in that is a lot of times in those kinds of businesses, it, it is hard to acquire customers. You, um, the general market you serve, the, the prospects might be few and far between, especially for the enterprise type software development solutions. So once you land one, you, you sure ought to do the work to keep them there. Right. Absolutely. And so talk to us a little bit about your experience in that realm, you know, doing the right thing to maintain those relationships. Yeah. So so when I had uh, a software company, it was uh, founded um, as a result of a relationship that I had with an individual um, who owned um, a stock. He was a, a senior VP at a, a stock brokerage firm. And Florida had passed a law that said, um, it was called the no solicitation law, which is now a federal law that said, if you didn't want to receive a call, an unsolicited sales call um, at your home or business, you could tell that person, take me off your list. And that business would have to have some type of a system process resource um, to be able to eliminate another call to that company person um, under the penalty of a potential fine as much as $10,000 uh, for for placing a redundant sales call unsolicited. And so um, his agents, like a lot of 
calls we all get today, whether it be for extended call warranties or pest control service or, or investments or whatever, um, his, his brokers were on the phone, you know, nine to five, dialing for dollars, as they say, in the telemarketing world. And, and they were under the, um, if they had to research um, the list of people at the time um, for who didn't want to get a call, well, they'd make two calls a day instead of 100 that they were supposed to make. Um, and so uh, my friend approached me and he says, Paul, is there any kind of a system now? He approached me because um, I did have a, a mathematical and computer background. That was my schooling that I never really took advantage of, except for a couple of years teaching high school mathematics out of college when I had those tennis shops I described earlier. Um, I was doing those two things concurrently until I decided to leave the teaching world and go strictly into business. Um, but I did have this technology background to some extent. And so my friend asked me, you know, once again, as I mentioned earlier, as a trusted resource, he trusted me that if I didn't know the answer, I'd be able to find it out. And sure enough, um, I didn't know how to do what he wanted to do, but I incorporated a computer development and a telephone um, developer um, and, a, and a software developer to be able to come up with a solution to this problem. And we actually created a hardware solution that would help companies um, stop calls to people who said they didn't want to get calls. And it actually became a software product that I had um, ended up selling through AT&T um, at the time and some other uh, businesses that built telephone equipment and that was selling to call centers and telemarketers. And that was one of my software success stories. But in the process of that, I found that, again, the hats I liked to wear and the ones I didn't like to wear. I liked learning what were those problems from those companies besides this, um, this job of, um, of making calls to people. It turned out that they also had an issue with when people would call them, knowing who they were and, and what they bought from them and being able to leverage caller ID to be able to identify who that caller was and what business they might have done with them before uh, to be able to expedite a future sales process. And so we actually made a variation of the software to respond to that. And, that's, um, and that became a separate product. But it was all because we, we listened to the customer, we found out what their problems were um, and what we could do to solve that. Um, it was, uh, and, and again, my hat that I like to wear throughout was just engaging the customers. I hired a computer programmer, I hired a software developer, somebody who knew telephone systems um, and let them run with the task needed um, once I engaged with the customers to find out what their pain points were and then um, you know, engage these companies to uh, purchase our software and yeah. license it. Yeah, great, great story there. Paul, you also mentioned that um, you now do some mentoring with uh, at, at the university level, doing some business uh, competition type judging and such. Uh, talk to us a little bit more about that. And, and my specific question is, what are you finding is front of mind in the up and coming, you know, the, the new young business students of the day? What, what kind of questions are they asking? Yeah, those are, those are great points and questions, uh, Doug. Uh, you know, everybody struggles to find their path. Um, you know, and today there's just as much pressure as always. Some people say more, you know, than it has been in the past because of the, just the nature of, uh, the, nature of the, the markets um, and, and what opportunities might be out there and also the cost of education and things like that influence, you know, where people go and how they get there. Uh, a lot of people are, you know, passing on college and going right into the business world, whether working for somebody or trying to step out and create something or own their own business. Um, you know, one of the good things that happened with us at the wall printer was COVID. Um, you know, please don't take it the wrong way. You, you know, you, you, your audience, that this was a good thing. Um, it was not a good thing. Um, and it still isn't. Uh, but for my business, um, people were at home and they or, and they were either laid off or working remotely, and they were having time to rethink their paths in their life, whether they were students or whether they were people already in the business world uh, for short time or for careers, they were deciding whether or not, you know, this is what they want to do um, tomorrow. And so they were looking at different things, and we came up as that different thing to a lot of people um, that was interesting and, and possibly another path. Um, but 
you know, as I said early on, I'm 70 years old. Um, I do have quite a bit of experiences. The benefit of that um, is that, you know, I do have these stories that I can share. And so it felt only um, it, it behooved me to, to share those with anybody who really felt it might be a benefit to them. And the, the most likely audience were people starting out and students coming through college. And so I've been here in Wilmington for about 12 years. There's an excellent university here, um, UNCW, which is the Wilmington branch of the uh, University of North Carolina uh, college system. And uh, they have an excellent business school, the Cameron School of Business. And uh, they asked me to be on their advisory board early on and also be a mentor at what they have as uh, they have a, a separate entity called the CIE, which stands for the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And they provide free services to faculty, students, and the community. Um, and they invite them to come in and, and present their ideas or, or we act as a resource. I wear the sales and marketing hats as I've described in this um, conversation with you and your audience. Others have legal expertise or patent expertise uh, intellectual property rights. Other people have computer programming expertise. Some have financial accounting expertise, um, some marketing, social media. Um, all of these types of people who have similar stories or experiences as I have had come together and offer these up to companies that might need that to grow from here to there and get from with their idea as you described uh, in introducing this, this part of our conversation. Um, and then where do I go to with this idea? Either how do I develop it from a technology standpoint, or once I develop it, what do I do with it? How do I find customers? Who should those customers be? How much is it going to cost? Where am I going to get the money to do it? How am I going to eat and feed my family? These are all the <laughs> questions that people right. are going to ask, and it goes on and on. Right. And, and, and just how is all that going to be accomplished, and what do I need to think about without, without being as overwhelmed or without it being as overwhelming as that just described. Right, and so, right. And so that's, you I, know, that's what we do here. I think you're really right. I, I think one of the byproducts of the, the pandemic and the lockdown was um, I, a lot of people did reevaluate their current plight and, and their sense of purpose. And that did cause the uh, traditional workforce to show up as companies started opening their doors again, uh, people were showing up with a different attitude and a different mindset. And I, I've talked about that with every one of my company clients in the last 18 months because they all um, they, they all anticipate it, but now that it's really begun happening, they didn't realize the magnitude of it. So if you're a business leader in a slightly larger setting, uh, maybe you're publicly traded, maybe you're not, you're still faced with this idea that the workforce is showing up with a new mindset. So for many people that I'm familiar with, they, they made the choice. They said, I don't want to work for corporate anymore. I want to go do my own thing. I want to figure that out. I want to go start a business. I want to go do something different. And it is a, it's an interesting time in our overall economy the role of the entrepreneur has always been huge in our economy and you, you have to take it with a grain of salt and look at the source of your data that you're reading. But every source will tell you that, you know, the small business community is what fuels most of the American economy. And uh, I absolutely agree. It's, I think uh, it's an interesting you know, dynamic and an interesting opportunity. Yeah. On a financial, emotional, cultural level, um, you know, it, it does exactly what you said, Doug. Um, it, it does fuel um, the growth of, of our country and, and our people. And, and it also allows us to thrive. And again, you know, I, I do caution everybody, you know, who might be listening, you know, to hear what maybe I haven't said enough of is that there are going to be bumps in the road. You know, there are going to be those learning experiences, as I alluded to briefly. Um, but but it's not, you know, there's the trite, I hate giving trite expressions, but sometimes they're trite because they actually are true. Uh, it's not how many times you fall down, but how many times you get up. And, yeah. uh, and, and it's, you know, nothing could be, it's true in athletics, it's true in, in business and life. And so, you know, you just have to keep going because the alternative is definitely not as attractive. So you have to just keep going. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. And, and again, whether, whether that leads you 
to the left, to the right, up, down, wherever, um, you know, to work for somebody, to work for yourself, to hire somebody, to partner with somebody. You know, these are all decisions that get made along your path. Um, just don't be afraid to take it. And, uh, you know, I, I don't care. You know, look at me. I'm 70 years old. I just did this three years ago. Um, so, you know, I don't think it's ever too late to, to try something new, whether it's a personal pursuit or a business pursuit. Well, um, I tell the story. I've got a good friend who's now in his 90s. And at the age of 65, he did a pivot. He sold one business he was in and started something totally new and uh, has already had a 30-year run with that new business when it was new at age 65. <laughs> <laughs> well, God bless him. So um, do the math. He, you know, uh, it, 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 yeah. My point in all that to any of you that are out there listening and thinking about it, it is doable. So, um, you know, Lord willing, you live into your 90s, uh, you know, it's worth thinking about what, what do you really want to be doing? Paul, we're yeah, going to need to uh, kind of wrap this up and put a bow on it. Tell everybody how they can best get a hold of you if they're interested in learning more about uh, the wall printer or or your great wisdom. Uh, well, I, I don't know that I resemble that remark, but, uh, but in any case, I, I welcome people to reach out and connect. That's really what, what life and business is all about. Um, this is not an advertisement for LinkedIn by any means at all, but LinkedIn is a professional network that is an excellent resource for people um, who want to learn about either other people's businesses or people who are in the same business or possibly something you're looking at. Um, just search for Paul Barron um, uh, you know, on LinkedIn and feel free to connect with me. I'm happy to do that on a personal level um, or professional. If you are interested in the wall printer, um, thewallprinter.com. Uh, you can learn more about it. You can inquire there. Um, we can send you information if it's something that's really of interest to you. Um, but again, both, both areas, whether it's for this particular business or just your own personal path that you'd like to talk about or, or get some feedback from me for whatever it might be worth, um, I can't guarantee the results, but, but do connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to do that. Sure. Well, again, thank you, Paul, for being a guest. It was a pleasure having you on. And folks, we're going to have those references in the show notes here. If you are um, didn't get that down as Paul was describing it, you can just click on the link for the notes to, to go with the show. I want to remind everyone that uh, this episode is available not only in the audio stream that you might be listening to right now, but we are uh, live in video over on the YouTube channel, Leadership Powered by Common Sense. Same name, uh, different channel. So feel free to jump over there and uh, check us out there. And uh, again, there'll be a copy of the show notes present for that. Paul, one last time, thank you very much, sir, for uh, your story and, and sharing with us. Right back at you, Doug. I enjoyed the time with you and your audience, and I hope everybody enjoyed it. Uh, I think they I think they did. So folks, we're going to sign off. This is another episode of Leadership Powered by Common Sense. I really appreciate you stopping in. And remember, if you're looking for some easy and simple answers to the big business challenges you've got, feel free to reach out to me also online, LinkedIn, and at my own website at dougthorpe.com. I'll uh, hook up with you and, and we can talk some common sense. Goodbye for now. You've been listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense, hosted by Doug Thorpe. If you would like to know more about the coaching and advisory services he provides, visit DougThorpe.com.